Thanks so much, Ryan. I have an answer for that. Uh, how have I done some of those things? And uh, it's coming up. You'll see. Um, I am excited to be here and be in a legendary place like Community Church and knowing its history. Uh, is John Griffin here? Great. So, uh, Dr. Peterson, John, raise your hand again. There, he's back there. Hey, my friend, uh, Dr. Peterson, who's been uh, a supporter of Call to Greatness for years, he told me, I, I was telling him a little bit of the story about Community Church and how... Uh, um, the two churches merged after John and his wife came and planted a church here, and these two churches merged. And he said, yeah, years ago, my kids used to attend uh, BBS here. Is that what you said? So it's just like, man, just to see the fruits of that going forward and, and, and the history that's here, it's, it's amazing. And so, um, but I'm excited to be here. My family is here with me today, or at least a few of them. Um, but before I introduce them, um, I'm originally from Houston, Texas, uh, born and raised there, and then was seeking and had a desire to want to play in the NFL and didn't get any offers out of high school, so got an opportunity to walk on at KU. I am a, a Rudy in a sense. If you've ever seen that movie, Rudy, uh, wasn't recruited by Notre Dame, shows up and, get, and got an opportunity to walk on and then um, uh, be a, a, consider myself part of the KU team back in 1999. And so while I was there, I studied African and African American studies and English creative writing. And with that, uh, I got a lot of black jokes that I'm going to try to deliver today. <laughs> so prepare yourself, because some of them are targeted towards white people. <laughs> so with that one, I'm going to start with my family. My wife and, oh, the answer to that question, Ryan, is how, did I, how was I able to do all these things? If you showed a picture of my family, which my wife, my wife, why was that one funny? I haven't even. <laughs> uh, my wife, Tori, who's from just north of Emporia, uh, Tori and I met at KU. And um, our first fight wasn't when we first got married. Actually, our first fight wasn't even while we were dating. In Morningstar, there was a concert going on, and uh, myself and another young man who was a worship leader got into a little fight. And basically, about maybe about 30 minutes before the concert was about to go on, we were about ready to cancel it because him and I got into this, this fight, this argument. In the hood, a fight is when you throw fists, so we didn't throw any fists. We got into this really intense argument. And so I left the room, and then here come Tori. I don't know if she grabbed my shoulder or whatnot, but she turned around. She goes, you're going to go back in there, and you're going to apologize, and you're going to make peace, and this and that. And so that was our first fight. And, I, you know, I pushed back some, and then I thought to myself, man, this might be the woman for me. How would I know? <laughs> if she white and she can fight, she my type. So... <laughs> And so shortly after that, or not shortly, I don't know if I was in ministry at the time, but basically what happened was we, we launched a youth ministry there at Morningstar Church. Myself and another young man, girls started coming around. Obviously, I'm not a girl. And we needed someone who understood ladies. And so we invited Tori to be a part of that. She said yes. And sparks flew. And like any NBA star, I shot my shot. And 20 years later, there she is. So we're, we're married. So... Yeah. Our three kids, uh, Zeb, Ayana in the middle, and then Isabel at the end. Isabel is here, and then Ayana's downstairs with the, um, the youth ministry. I think we found a place for her to help. She really loves kids. And Zeb uh, is 17, or going to be 17. As you know, 17-year-olds, they get to make their own decisions now, I guess. So, um, but I want to tell you with you guys some cute names before we get into the message. Is it okay? So when they were first born, we gave them some cute names. Everyone sees the picture now. I have to explain this joke to Ryan. So, so, all right, you guys ready? Zeb, cute little name was Graham Cracker. The next one is Ritz Cracker. And the last one is we thin. <laughs> All right. 
for anyone that they went over their heads, I'm black, Tori's white. Crackers, baby, you got it. So that was that one. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. I, like I said, I'm from Houston. I've had some big moves in my life, some big moves. We, and, and, and part of that has been with Tori, and I'm able to do a lot of those things because of uh, Tori and her faith and us coming together and this, this union and really not seeing Tori as Lord, but really what it meant when God said, man, let me give you a helper, you know, and I found a lot of favor in that, as the Bible says. And so, but coming from Houston to Kansas, where I met a lot of white people, I'm from inner city Houston, and when I got here, there was a lot of white people here. I had so many, so many. I didn't realize there were this many white people on earth. <laughs> and uh, getting here um, from that point and being in Lawrence for, for multiple years, uh, about, what, four years ago now, babe? We, we moved from Lawrence after really establishing ourselves down to Fort Scott and working with the Fort Scott community team and, and, and at that uh, community football team, a community college, but the football team. And the move wasn't as, as impactful to me as it was I was seeing it in our kids. There's different, you know, you're hurt or maybe your ankles hurt or whatever, and you're like, okay, I can get over this. But when you're seeing it affect your kids, it, it just it took me to a new level. Of, of, of being a, a husband and a father and, and working through that. But we went down to Fort Scott. We thought we were going to be there three to five years. They ended up canceling the football team the year we moved down there. And so then we're praying on what we're going to do next. And that was three about three years ago when we moved to Manhattan, Kansas. And so in the midst of that, the, the transition, the uprooting, the, the uh, uh, moving away from friends and these different things, man, things got cloudy. Things got a little bit confusing. I just was unsure what God was doing and, 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 and felt a little bit of, uh, of some depression just trying to figure things out. And so I just want to ask you, right, when you're meeting and when you're experiencing these tough times and these transitions and this unsurety and wanting to know if the decision you're making is the right one, what do we do? What do we do when we get a roadblock, we get in a fork in the road, those different things? I want to share a story with you about a lady named... Florence Chadwick. And when I first shared this, I didn't realize I had the story backwards. This young lady swam the English Channel back in 1950 both ways. She was the first woman to do that. It was a, uh, about a, a, a 13, 14 hour swim, right? Um, but then later she, she swam from California, the coast of California, to the Catalina Island. And the first attempt, this is what happened. Um, she, she got in the water, it was a, it was a cold, day or the water was cold pretty choppy not extra crazy but you know it wasn't smooth sailing two boats were accompanying her one had her mother and another one had some uh uh, some uh, riflemen with her just in case any uh, sharks tried to attack her and when she got in and she began to swim this 26 miles right about 16 hour swim 26 mile marathon or swimming uh about 15 hours into it uh, the fog began to set in and so she couldn't see, she, it's, the story reads that it was so foggy that she could barely see her hands as she did the strokes. And so when it set in, she thought, oh, no, I, I'll just keep going the fog lift. And she kept swimming, and in about another hour, um, she finally decided, hey, I, I, I'm giving up. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and hop in the boat, try it a different day or something. Once she gets in the boat, the fog lifts, and there is the Catalina Islands coast right there. And she was interviewed, and she said, there's no excuse, but had I seen that coast about a mile away, I would have kept swimming. And just like that, she thought, okay, I don't know the break between when she did the first one and the second one, but she attempts it a second time. She gets in, and just like the last time, just like the first time, she gets in there, she's swimming, about 15 hours in, the fall comes in and sets in again. And she's barely seeing herself in her hands as she's uh, swimming. Boom. And, but what she had different than the first time was this mental image of what that coastline looked like. So she kept swimming and kept swimming. And shortly after that, the fog lifted, and there's the coastline just, just a, uh, uh, a mile away. And she ended up finishing and accomplishing something that uh, I will never do. because, <laughs> And it's not because I'm black. I can swim. So... Not very good, but I can swim. 
So my question is, when, 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 when things get rough, when the fog sets in, when things are unclear, when the God or when, when life says, take your 10-month-old daughter who needs to have open heart surgery and give them to the doctor so she could get holes in her heart fixed, what are you going to do? When he, God asks you in, in one year to move seven times, we had this heart like, man, we're going to reach each Lawrence. So we moved from one house to stay with a friend, to stay at someone else's house, back to that house, to this other house, then finally getting to where we're supposed to do. Be, and be where we're supposed to be. When, when things like that are happening, you're not sure what direction to go. What are you going to do? And this is something that's helped me and it continues to help me. And it says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. If you want to live a life without regret, a life that, that says, hey, you know what? I know I'm in the midst of the fog. I know things are cold. I know I, I'm, I'm probably alone or whatever, you know, these thoughts and fears and pressures that come up upon you. If you want to live this life without regret, you got to keep the prophetic vision before you. One, one thing I'm not liking today in our culture is the, the, the movies that are coming out in the sense that there's, there's not a lot of them that have prophetic voice to them. I've told you about Rudy. Rudy was in, not necessarily a prophetic voice to the culture, but, I mean, it was someone fighting for something that was incredible to do. And especially for me, it's just like, man, I'm not being recruited. I don't have the money. What am I going to do? And that was an inspiration to me. Another one of the things is the Cowboys uh, with, um, 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 I kind of forgot his name, uh, John Wayne. There's this old Western movie uh, with John Wayne, and he's a cowboy, and all these young cowboys, I think they're between the ages of like 15 and 19, they find him, and they basically say, hey, man, we want to be cowboys, teach us the way, right? And he's probably in the movie like 50, and he's trying to teach these youngins how to do it, but that spoke to me when I first uh, uh, saw it. And it became a prophetic vision for me on, in, in youth ministry. The gridiron gang, the same thing. Like, really, what does it take to get people out, out of the junk that they're living in to something, to a purpose, a call to a purpose that's higher than they could ever dream or imagine? It says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. With John, uh, so what is the law? Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet. And a light to my path. And I believe in this moment, God is not only giving, obviously he's giving you the Bible and the words, but he's wanting to give you a blueprint, a destiny, a design that, man, there's something he's calling you more to. And I think some of us have that prophetic vision, but somehow we've lost it. We've made decisions that go against that prophetic vision. We've done things that we know, oh, I shouldn't have did that. I shouldn't have been involved in that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done those things. And so what I would like to do is we're going to look at the story of uh, Esau and how he made an impulsive decision that he later regretted in regards to his, the prophetic vision he had for his life. Have, uh, write this down for me. To live without regret, we must keep the prophetic vision before us. To live without regret, we must keep the prophetic vision before us. And I was excited to... Uh, uh, be invited here to speak and knowing that you guys are going through seven habits of a highly effective disciple. And uh, I thought, man, what kind of, since we like movies and stuff, I say, what, what, what kind of movie is this? Like, like, how can I relate this and what's going on? And I thought, or I'm not necessarily speaking about being a highly effective disciple, but I, I am invited to just share my life and share what's going on. And the movie that came to mind was Benjamin Button. Some of you guys are like, I don't know how that relates. I know. Here he comes. You remember in the movie when that guy was like, did it tell you the time I got struck by lightning? It, all right, no one knows about Benjamin Button? <laughs> no? Okay, a few people. Dang, that's not going to hit. I'm going to just skip over it. Gosh. Benjamin Button is about a guy who was born old, and then he dies when he's young. And it's a great, funny movie, especially there's a part that it, there's like comic relief. And this guy goes, did I tell you by the time I got struck seven times by lightning? And so in this movie that you guys are going through with the highly effective disciples, right, I'm the guy that's saying, hey, let me tell you about this time I got struck by lightning. <laughs> and hopefully you would be struck by it and be invigorated and ready to go and 
ready to take on life and this transformation you're going to go through to become more of a highly effective disciple. <clears throat> your destiny is at hand, and just know that you're making decisions with your destiny in view versus feeling the feelings and surrounding perception. And we want to handle that with our prophetic view in, in hand. And so what happened was you have uh, Esau, who was the leader, uh, going to be the leader of his family, Abraham, Isaac, and Esau is how it should have went. But it went Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Esau and Jacob are twins, but Esau came out first. And in ancient Near East, the birthright the, was a significant inheritance that included the right to inherit the family property, leadership, spiritual responsibilities. The birthright was a symbol of God's blessing and promise to the family. And some of you who are older siblings probably have felt that, right? When mom or dad leave, you kind of feel the responsibility to make sure all the kids are taken care of or whatnot. I don't think that's an accident that older people or older siblings typically feel that way. And because that's what it, that's, I think that was God's intention. And so Esau, was a, his birthright was to be able to take care uh, 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 these uh, um, God's people, but he ended up selling his birthright. Um, let me describe a little bit of what that birthright was, as it does in the Bible here in Genesis 26. This is God talking to uh, Isaac, right? And Isaac is going to then pass this down to Esau. It says in verse 3 of 26, Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as stars of heaven and will give, you, give to you your offsprings all these lands. So that, there's this, this family leadership. Where are we going to go? Where, we, where should we establish ourselves? Hey, in these lands where God has already told us. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments my statutes, and my laws. And so here's that spiritual, in the sense, that, that guidance of the family, that leadership of the family, that this is all Esau, what, what Esau was supposed to be, in a sense, bearing as the, the leader of his, his, his family once Isaac passed it down to him. <clears throat> so the promise Esau was to inherit, what was, what, what was supposed to be put upon him, was originally given to his grandfather Abraham then. And so what the Bible does is gives us a scene of Esau and Jacob later on, or not prior to the inheritance, prior to the, the blessing. He gives us the scene of how Esau sold that birthright. And this is where we're going to dive in. Uh, Jacob is kind of a, is a man of the field. You'll see that in the story. And Esau, some people describe as someone who hung around home a lot. All right? And so not that either one is greater than the other, but just a little bit of background for those guys. Genesis 25, verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And I think it's important, right? Anyone ever made a bad decision while they're exhausted? Right? He was exhausted. And then when we talk about exhausted, I'm talking about like, man, I am about to fall asleep on you, exhausted. He's tired. He's a man of the field. He likes hunting. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, I, I got a great deal for you. Sell me your birthright. Sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? I'm about to die. What use is my leadership? I'm about to die. What use is it for me to to, to spend time with my kids. I, I can't really be a good father. I'm about to die. If I make this decision, I'm going to lose all my friends, right? What, what use is it to me to make a decision that, that God is directing me in? I'm about to die. My needs are so great that, that I shouldn't really focus on what God has already given to me, is what he was saying. And I think sometimes we, we ask ourselves that. Man, I'm about to lose friends. I can't stand up for Jesus in this one. Right? I'm about to lose money. I can't take this sacrifice and take this job, even though I, I feel like God is calling me to this one. Right? What, of what use is this call of God on my life if I'm about to die? <clears throat> I 
when we lose sight of the vision of our life, when we're not thinking about the prophetic vision at hand, we let how we feel and our circumstances drive us to ask, what use is this leadership? What use is my help? What use is it to serve? People don't thank me. Why would I ever sign up for a leadership team? No, I'm not, I'm not signing up for that. But maybe God is calling you into serving because they need more people to say thank you. In verse 33, it says this. Jacob says, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and he drank and he rose and he went away. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. He saw it as worthless. He saw it as worthless. He saw it as worthless. I grew up, growing up, man, I grew up in a single parent home. Uh, and like many, ki- I, I, like many young African American men, started smoking weed at 12. At 14, I started selling it. 14, I helped start a gang. It wasn't because I wanted to be some kingpin or something. It was really because I was looking for camaraderie. I was looking for identity. I chased football because it gave me an identity. And the very thing that was in my heart, though, I wanted, I wanted a family. I did. Matter of fact, as a freshman at KU, I was walking on campus, beautiful day, and, and I think it just all just hit me. Man, Lawrence is a pretty cool place. I can raise a family here. While everybody else was thinking about, I can hang out with that girl, or go to this party, or do this, I was like, I could raise a family here because I wanted to be a father. And everything that I pursued after that, it was about, man, how can I be someone that I, I didn't have or haven't seen and, and, and that is calling me. I know God was calling me to be a father. And thank goodness I, I, I showed my, I, whatever Tori saw in me, I, I presented myself. She said yes, and we're married. And I, I got not only could be a husband, I, got, I was able to be a father out of that because I knew the prophetic vision that was one of the prophetic visions that was on my life and what God was calling me to do. When he, so here's, here's, here's a, something, he, 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 lentil stew is what he uh, sold his birthright for, all right? And I'm not a fan of lentil stew. I had some once, <laughs> once. <laughs> but even, maybe he liked lentil stew, I don't know, but check this out. Right when Isaac is getting ready to bless him, he said, hey, before I bless you, go out and make that delicious stew that you make. And then after I eat, I will bless you. So we know he had skills. We know he knew how to cook. But as the young folks say today, he sold. All right, we don't have many young folks in here, okay. Well, (laughs) when my son is playing Fortnite and I'm overhearing him talk, he goes, oh man, you sold, you sold, which means you didn't come through on your end of the bargain, which means sell out, okay. So I don't know why they just want to say sell out, but sold. So he sold in the sense he, he didn't come through on his end of the bargain in the sense like, man, if you'd have just waited, cooked your own stew, you'd have had something better than lentil stew. And typically we do that. We sell out for something lesser. We sell, we, here's the thing. I'm chasing football. And thank goodness, I, I mean, I gave a lot to football. I gave a lot. But I wish I had saw this a little bit earlier. If I, if I tell people, if there's one thing I regret, it's not giving my life to Christ earlier. I sold, I was selling everything for football. And I told somebody once, man, I, I didn't ever have a chance to take steroids. But if it had to be presented, I think I would have. But here's the thing about football. I was chasing football because I was going to go to the league and get a bag, which means money. <laughs> and then I was going to go back to Houston and build a rec center. And, and, and build families and do mentoring. Here's the kicker. I've never played a lick of NFL football, but I've been able to do everything in my heart that I've ever dreamed that I would do for a community. Amen. Come on, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Leading families, mentoring young men, uh, uh, Bible studies, all these things that are greater than me because I sold out to the one who can do it all. The hard issue is we are seeing our calling as worthless when we make those decisions. Your calling, it's, 
I was talking to a Junction City football team, and I showed them a picture of an apple. And I asked them, what do you see? And they said, an apple. And I told them, no, that's an orchard. Because if you take the seeds and you plant it and you invest the time, you can have an orchard. If you take your calling, see, see, what we don't realize is our calling is bigger than ourselves. There's some benefit that we get out of it. There's some benefit. I love having my family. I love being with her. I love what we've done. But really, it's, it, there's a call of something greater that if you can fulfill that, it's going to bring about something larger. And what happens is when we make decisions that are impulsive, we, 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 we see our calling as worthless. My question to you is, do you know who you are? Do you understand your calling? Do you have a vision before you, uh, before you of that? What are you progressing forward towards? To live a life without regret, you must keep the prophetic vision before you. Tori and I, um, I think, uh, might have been two or three years after we were uh, married, we were at in, in, in Morningstar, and they brought the staff in, and they started praying for each one. And for us, our word was persistently paving. Persistently paving. And it, it was just like this lid was taken off. And there was more understanding and more revelation because when we helped start the youth ministry, it was paving a way to help bring more youth into the, to the, uh, uh, the call that God had for them. It wasn't, there, there was a youth ministry there, but it wasn't doing the things that they thought, man, hey, there could be a, there's another level to this. And we persistently paved and connecting with the schools there, connecting with principals and doing different outreach things. And then we had this idea, let's go down to Fort Scott. Let's, let's move there. And a lot of those guys down there had this, 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 this same dream I had. Man, football is the only way. But, man, if we can make an impact in their lives right now, they will see that Jesus will make you significant, that you don't have to rest your life on that. And that's what we begin, just persistently paving, going after it. I know one thing in my life. I know, I know for sure this is that God has called me to help people see that the issue isn't black and white in a sense of racially, ethnicity. I grew up in, a, uh, in an inner city of Houston, and much of when I came to Lawrence, I came in with a, tr a mistrust for white people. I, I hadn't, in a sense, necessarily had a lot of uh, negative interactions with white people, but the things my parents said, my mother said, and aunt said, I was like, okay, man, white people can't be trusted. You guys want to know something funny, though? Every person that helped me grow in my faith when I got on that campus was white even though they couldn't dance. <laughs> it changed my life. And I found out white men can jump. <laughs> I had a buddy from Reed Springs, Missouri, Reed Springs named Clay. Him and his, my other friend Dan were arguing about who can dunk. And he stood under the goal. He's six feet, and he jumped and grabbed and dunked the ball. And I was just like, oh, white man can dunk. Okay. <laughs> but it, it's just that's... I was, I was at pers persistently paving, paving this idea, paving this way that, you know, church and Christ and Jesus as Lord isn't the, the white man's religion. It's a call to, to God is calling everyone into his kingdom. Everyone. Everyone. When my, originally, when I was trying to get my act right, I thought to myself, man, I'm going a, I'm to a marry a black woman. I think the world needs to see a black couple thriving together and, and having a fruitful marriage and then as I understood more, it was like, no, what the world needs to see more is a husband dying for his wife as Christ did for the church. Amen. Come on now, somebody, please. <clears throat> we can't get blinded by our hunger. We can't get blinded by our own desire for this culture. We can't get blinded by our own pride. We can't get blinded by our lack of faith. You can't get blinded by your depression. I was sitting there, they counseled the football team in November of uh, uh, 21. So we said we're going to pray till about January where we should go next, we just, or if we should stay. We said, okay, no, we're not supposed to stay. Where we go next? And I'm just confused because we're supposed to be there three to five years. And I, and I just, I got just, I tried to live through it and just, I couldn't understand what was going on. And, and, and got into this depression. 
Many days I was just like, okay, God, what, what, what did I do next? I don't know. You can't get blinded by your lack of faith. Don't get blinded by your children. Right? Many times we get blinded. Hey, the children is trying to tell us we should go this way, and it's like, no, 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 no. And De- Deuteronomy says, I teach you these things and write them on the wall and teach you the way to go. Not, you don't train me up in the way to go. Right? You can't get blinded by your shortcomings. You can't get blinded by your blind spots. You can't get blinded by the hunger for justice. So we get so caught up for hunger for justice and see lives change that we forget Jesus in the whole equation. But the thing is, in those moments when the fog sets in, when you're unsure, that should draw us closer to Jesus. More and more that we should be diving. Okay, Jesus, man, I am hurt. I'm confused. Jesus, I can't, I don't know how to talk or... Or I don't know how to be the husband you called me to be. Or I don't know how to be the minister you called me. I don't know how to be the business person you called me. Those should draw us, draw us more versus giving up and, and, and not seeing our, uh, our um, prophetic call and keeping it in light. As a minister, I just want to th- add this part in. As you think about becoming that highly effective disciple, man, Jesus is that prophetic vision for you. Jesus is that prophetic vision for you. And you guys talked about this a couple weeks ago, uh, Matthew 419, right? Follow me. Follow me is what he said. Follow me, and I will make you. I'll come back to that when I get ready to close. Going without restraint. For you, some of those restraints might be the habits that you guys are going to be talking about, have talked about, and going to be talking about. If you go without those restraints, you're going to miss your prophetic vision. But if you keep those habits, if you keep those restraints, your prophetic vision, you, you'll draw closer to it more and more. But if you go without them, this is what happened. You live without the prophetic vision, you can, it can lead to impulsive decision making. All right, we probably all bought those pair of shoes that we really liked and a week later thought, man, I need those $100 back. <laughs> right? right? I really don't like those shoes. Impulsive decisions. Living without the prophetic vision can lead to a lack of self-control or show us areas where we lack self-control, all right? Yeah, I know you don't want to hear this, but that diet you've been on for a while, right? You have that prophetic vision before you like I do. It's like, man, I want to be slim and trim. But the cakes are too good. (laughs) One guy I heard talk, he said, man, why is the treadmill so tough, so ugly, but it's good for you? And donuts, so tasty, so sweet, but they're bad for you. <clears throat> Living without the prophetic vision shows our lack of trust in God. In EHS, if you've been through emotional, healthy spirituality, you've probably read this once. But it says this. It was, it was referencing Abraham and how he was supposed to move. It said, uh, he, you know, he's, he, God had called him to a, a, a different land. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without, without delay. We should like to skip the in, either intermediate stage. We, we are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. Or better said, we are impatient of being on the way to that prophetic vision coming to fruition. When you live without restraints, it, t- it shows you your lack of self-control, your lack of trust in God, and, and it shows these, it can lead to impulsive decision-making. So here's, here's an opportunity where we get to do something about it. If, if you've been sitting there and you've been realizing, man, I've made some decisions I shouldn't have made. I've, I've said some things I shouldn't have done. I've taken steps that were not good. God offers us repentance. We all, there is grace. In Hebrews 12, Right, and, I, and I'm hoping in this time right now that some of you, uh, as the prayer team was praying, one of the things that they mentioned was that someone needed to be released. That they, 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 they've had shame on themselves, but God wants to release them from, from that shame. And it says this in Hebrews 12, 15. Paul is talking to him. He says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. All right, God is giving you grace in this moment. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. 
for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. The message Bible says, like, says it like this, starting at verse 17. You will know how Esau regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing. But by then, it was too late. Tears are no tears. God has given us the opportunity to experience his grace and repent. And so before I continue, I just want to, I want to just take a, a, a brief moment. Later, we're going to have our ministry team come up, not at this moment, but I just want to take a moment right here just as a step. If you're one of those people, just say, we're going to bow our heads, and you're going to say, Lord, I repent for whatever that thing is, that decision, that word. Th maybe it's a lie that you believed, right? Here's the, here's the thing about the lie. One of the lies is I've got to wait 40 or 50 years to know what God is calling me to do. My dad, when I was 12 years old, would take kids and invite them over his house and treat them. Take us all out in a day, in a time, and in an era when black dads were not worried about their kids. He would take other people's kids. That spoke to me. I remember that because I know that was part of my calling at that time. That was part of a prophetic vision that he was saying to me, hey, you're going to gather kids. There's things God has dropped in your heart when you were 2, 3, 10, 12 years old. The, really, the way it works is, I've never been an engineer, so forgive me, but when you build a building, or especially a big one, they have like three or four sheets. They show you the first level, and there's like this one kind of, like, hey, here's part of the structure, and then they take another sheet, and they lay it over, and then it has, adds more dynamics to it. You, anyone know what I'm talking about? Any engineer? Am I right? Right? And it, boom, boom. And that's what God is doing. Like, he's, he's giving it to you, and some of you have believed a lot that I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm unsure. No, 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 no. He's revealing it to you. You just got to trust him in the confusion that, God, I'm going to go ahead and make this decision to study this at Washburn, and I'm going to trust that you'll be with me in that moment, whether it was the wrong, whether there's the wrong major or not. I trusted him at, in football. I trust, we trusted him when we went down to Fort Scott. We're trusting him now. And sometimes we believe that a lot of that, man, if I, miss, if I make this decision, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to be lost. No. So in this moment right now, just, just there's something you want to repent for. Just we're gonna take a moment and just say, Lord, I repent for. So go ahead. All right, next thing. I I, I had been thinking about for you guys th this thing. And, and I had asked John about it. He said, yeah, he had spoken on this a couple weeks ago. And it's, it goes back to that Matthew 4, 19. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And some of you may not be clear on what that looks like for you. Some of you are, are, are maybe unclear because you know it's going to be hard or impossible to become that thing. It's going to be impossible to become that thing. I can tell you this. All right, and, and, and Ryan and Miriam can attest, and anyone who known me before I was married knew that, man, it's going to be a miracle for that guy to be a husband. <laughs> God, I followed Jesus, and he's made me and making me into the husband that I could be for Tori. And I told God, please, let us, let us live out our days together. I wanted, I wanted that story like, where the one passed away and then the other one passes away next to him because they, they couldn't be without each other. Because everything that I've had to be transformed and come out of in my knuckleheadedness, I don't know that I can love another woman. You guys don't get what I'm saying. It's hard to be transformed into loving someone. So I'm just like, Jesus, just the, the miracle that it is taking for me to be who God is calling me to be. But you know what I did? I followed Jesus. And that prophetic vision that's before you, if you follow Jesus, he will make you. If you follow Jesus, he will make you into that business man or woman. He will make you into that coach. He will make you into that teacher. He's going to make you into that fisher of men. But you got to be willing to follow Jesus. And so if we could go ahead and have the uh, ministry team come up. And if you want prayer, God, I just, I, I, I really don't see it. I don't know how I can become this person. I don't, I, I, I'm unclear on what you're asking me to do. I'm unsure. I, whatever it would, 
take this opportunity to let the ministry team pray for you and speak encouragement to you, speak some faith to you. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray and then close and release this. Is that okay? All right. Now we thank you. We thank you that you, you give us grace so that we can repent, that there is salvation, that we can be saved from our own way of thinking, our own ideas, and walk into the calling you have for us. And then, Lord, that if we follow you, we will be made into who you create us to be, to these fishers of men, to these fishers of people that you've called us to be. But we must be willing to follow you and be made into that. So, Lord, we thank you. I pray a blessing over everyone today that they, that they, that, they, that, they um, that you would edify the vision you have for them more. Bless them, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come up if you want prayer, but be re released and, have, and enjoy your Sunday.